Okay, so we're going to be talking about boosting aerobic capacity, chapter 16 of the textbook. Presenting today is Nathan, Jordan, and Chrisanne. Hey. Hi. Some of the topics we'll be covering are assessment, planning, and training. Several factors should be taken into account to establish a training program. During this presentation, our main focus will be the initial level and more specifically on the assessment of the athlete. This is Killian Jornet. He's a ski mountaineer and ultra runner. He has one of the highest recorded VO2 maxes in recent history at 90 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So something interesting about Killian is he actually has a uh, lung capacity of about 5.3 liters. I've recorded mine in our physiology lab at just about six. But as you'll see, that alone is not enough to determine the aerobic capacity or fitness of an individual. Aerobic capacity is most precisely evaluated by determining VO2 max, and it's often assessed with the use of a breathing mask to measure gas exchange. This method is effective, however, it can be time-consuming, complicated, expensive, and unaccessible to most. An easier method for measuring aerobic capacity is through the use of maximum aerobic speed. So that's what we're going to talk about. Laguerre and Mercier were able to show that MAS is closely co correlated to VO2 max by the use of this equation. In 1984, they studied about 130 subjects and they measured their full VO2 max using the mask and everything. And then they also did a simple treadmill test. They then compared the two results, did a little bit of math, and came up with this equation. So if you take the MAS that they found from the simple treadmill test and you multiply it by 3.5, you roughly get their VO2 max. So to, do, to measure MAS, you'll begin running on a treadmill with the initial speed set between 8 and 12 kilometers per hour. 8 kilometers is for someone who's untrained, and then 12 is for more elite athletes. You run each step at two minute increments. At the end of the two minutes, speed is then increased by one kilometer per hour for the next two minutes. This stepwise progression continues until the athlete can no longer maintain that speed. The last completed step is then used to determine the MAS. Here's a chart showing on the left the velocity and then on the right the comparable VO2 max. So we decided to run this ourselves, and here this shows one of us. The MAS was 14. That was the last step they were able to complete. And then using that equation, VO2 max was 49. So here are our VO2 maxes that we calculated from doing the simple treadmill test. The use of MAS allows you to, to determine the different training needs of each athlete. You can see here that the three of us would not be able to train together at the same pace and that we all have different specifications for training based on our experience and goals. To date, Lake Air's equation is one of the best alternatives for prediction of VO2 max throughout the wide range of development. So the next factor to determine aerobic endurance is planning critical speed. So critical speed is defined as the threshold intensity above which exercise of sufficient duration leads to attainment of VO2 max. So to be able to calculate critical speed, all you need to do is perform two different distance runs at max effort for greater than three minutes in duration. By dividing the distance over the time, you generate your critical speed as shown on this slide. So we decided to take Nathan's um, information and determine his critical speed. So the first run was a 1500 meter run and he ran it in 480 seconds. The second was a 300 or 3000 meter run, sorry, and he ran it in a thousand seconds. We did the math and were able to generate his critical speed at 11 kilometers per hour. So this is his calculated critical speed. The speed signifies the pace at which he needs to train to improve his aerobic endurance. 
So aerobic endurance represents the ability to sustain a high percentage of VO2 max for a long period. All right. So to be able to estimate critical speed, the MAS test is also useful. It allows us to estimate the pace you would have your athlete to train <laughs> to improve endurance. Critical speed is generally between 70 and 90% of MAS. So in a training program, aiming to improve VO2 max, the intensity should be higher than the speed. So if you remember, Nathan's MAS was 16.5. So if we use 70% of his MAS, we're able to estimate his critical speed to be about 11.5, which was within that range of calculated critical speed, which was 11. Now I'm going to talk briefly about an alternative method to determine your, your training pace. And it's called the Maffetone method. Dr. Phil Maffetone is a chiropractor who became quite famous because he has trained some athletes that were very successful using his method. One example is Mark Allen, who's a six-time Ironman world champion. Um, and he used the Maffetone method to train and beat his competitors. The simple way to calculate this pace is this 180 formula. And it's, you just start with 180, you subtract your age, and then you subtract a couple more points based on other X factors, such as whether you've been sick, whether you've been injured. And this gives you a heart rate at which you're going to train. So I did this last year when I was training for a 50 mile run. Uh, so 180 minus my age, 33, and then minus 5 because I had been injured and sick more than a couple times that year, gave me 142. So 142 is the heart rate, the max heart rate, that I can achieve when I'm training, meaning I have to stay be beneath that. So the range that I trained in was 132 to 142 beats per minute. And I did that for three months um, while I was training for this run around Mount Hood. Uh, I also studied my flashcards while training. And I did uh, a couple of trials so you can keep track of how you are improving. Instead of looking at, you know, training by pace, you look at your pace at that particular heart rate. So when I started, I had uh, a mile pace of 521 seconds, that's somewhere around eight and a half to nine minutes per mile. And I began training using the heart rate method. And over the first three weeks, I dropped about 40 seconds off of my mile time. Uh, over the next couple months, it went back up a little bit, but by the end, I was able to lose uh, over 30 seconds off of my mile pace. So that's just by running at this slow but long pace. And other athletes have reported very similar benefits. Um, Maffetone kept data on athletes that he trained, and for 233 of his athletes, 76% of them were able to run a, a personal best in their 5K distance after about three to six months training like this. But this isn't without controversy. This data uh, was going to be published in an article recently, and Tracy Hoag was the doctor that was going to present it. She, she presented the data, but this data was from 1980s. Uh, it wasn't well controlled. This was before personal heart rate monitors. Phil Maffetone was using this one that weighed like a pound. And so athletes weren't necessarily using heart rate every day. Uh, also, there's still a battle between this idea of long and slow versus the more high intensity, like the HIT training, the high intensity intervals. So, which is better? In a study by Murius and Kowalczuk in 2010, they were able to show that the slow, the long, and low intensity training provides central adaptations in the way of greater maximal cardiac output. So you're changing stroke volume. This uh, is because of the Frank Starling law. But if you do high intensity training, what you're going to see is a peripheral adaptation. That's in, measured by bigger arterial venous oxygen difference. So assuming that the muscles are better able to take up oxygen and the mitochondria become more productive. So, that's the difference between low intensity, 
long endurance versus the high intensity bouts. And that wraps it up for our overview of chapter 16 on boosting aerobic capacity. There's a lot more we didn't cover on uh, more specific training protocols. You can check out uh, Cisco's video for that.